So welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming. And I know that uh, you, like I, am uh, excited uh, to have Mr. Brennan with us. Uh, and thank you so much. And I'll just say a word or two. Uh, I am really thrilled uh, that uh, Director Brennan has uh, agreed to join us and to work with our Center on National Security uh, really for the next two years and uh, to help bring his perspective uh, after four decades in government uh, working on national intelligence, principally at the Central Intelligence Agency, where he served as director from uh, 2013 to 2017, uh, but also at the White House in a variety of positions. Um, to, uh, to bring your perspective, your wisdom, knowledge, and expertise to us here at Fordham, uh, and of course to uh, broader audiences as well. This evening there's a major program with David Ignatius of the Washington Post, uh, a conversation between Director Brennan and uh, David Ignatius here in this very room, probably in um, you know, similar seats even. Uh, but let me just one more point on, uh, by way of introduction. Uh, John Brennan is a uh, graduate of Fordham College, uh, class of 1977, uh, and has a uh, lifelong devotion and attachment to our university that I think makes it extra special. And that attachment and devotion and your commitment to public service and serving our nation uh, you know, is truly special and a, a fantastic combination. I also want to thank you, Karen, uh, for your leadership of the center and for making all of this possible and bringing together all the moving parts. We have here basically the uh, Fordham faculty uh, and then students in two classes, um, uh, Karen's class and Catherine's Powell cl Catherine Powell's class uh, as well. I'm going to get out of the way. Thank you. I don't know. Project. So um, I want to just start with why actually you are at Fordham. I know, I know what you've said. You've said you know that Fordham um, gave you your start and you're indebted. But what was it that Fordham did that you tie so directly to who you become in the world? Well, I, I benefited greatly from the education I received at Fordham. It got me interested in um, the Middle East. Uh, um, I went uh, in my junior year over to the American University in Cairo. It was because of a pamphlet that uh, Professor Entelis had brought into my class in comparative politics in my sophomore year. But I think more fundamentally, the classes that I remember probably most vividly from Fordham were my philosophy and theology classes. That really made me think about who I am and was and where we fit in in life and just the, the evolution of, of mankind. And I was mentioning in one of the class that I just was at that um, there were a lot of times in um, my government career, particularly over the last eight years when I served at the White House and at CIA, when I went down to my bookshelf in my basement and pulled out my, some of my old philosophy books from Fordham um, and to reread aspects of just war theory and other things as I agonized over a number of policies and decisions that I had to make. And I felt that that experience at Fordham at a very formative time of my life was, was crucial in you know, making me uh, who I am today. And I just really feel a, a special affinity to uh, Fordham uh, because it was an impressionable uh, time. Um, I was just emerging from you know, teenagerhood. And uh, I had thought about going to law school. Fordham Law School was one of the ones that I had considered but then decided that I was going to pursue a doctorate um, in uh, government and Middle Eastern studies, which is why I went down to the University of Texas, where I'm also a non-resident scholar. I believe very uh, strongly in giving back to the institutions that help prepare me for my professional career. So the various Ivy League schools that uh, have made overtures to me, I said, thanks, but no thanks. Um, if you didn't want me when I was young, you're not going to have me now. <laughs> 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 and I. <laughs> and I was up at Harvard uh, a couple of years ago when I, I spoke to the law school up there and a lot of students and I 
I said I, I really wanted to meet the, all the, the students who are getting a good, uh, a good uh, education in law, uh, despite the fact that they couldn't get into Fordham Law School. So <laughs> that went over really well at Harvard. <laughs> but I, I, I do feel nothing. And I, when I gave the commencement address back in 2012, I received an honorary degree. It was very, very special to me. Uh, so yeah, Fordham means something to me. Well, welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to just talk a little bit, because we have so many students here, about your decision to go to Egypt. Um, was that a trend then? <laughs> I mean, you know, we have another fellow who spent time at the American University in Cairo, Larry Wright. It was a transformative, you know, for him, and it set him on the course of his life, which he's still, you know, reaping the benefits of that. What, what possessed you to go to Egypt, first of all? And I know you said, was it just happenstance and once you got there what what struck you what was it that that held you? well i already had wanderlust in me um i was a commuter student uh, from uh, northern new jersey and so taking the the bus and two trains up to fordham road uh an hour and a half each way it sort of got a little bit old uh and it was happenstance that i happened to be in that class in sophomore year when professor antelis brought that in but in the summer of my freshman year I went over to Indonesia. My cousin was the food for peace officer for AID at the time, the embassy. And so I uh, talked to Professor Entelis into um, allowing me to do a tutorial on oil and politics in Indonesia. So I was out there for two and a half months, uh, interviewed a lot of uh, Indonesian officials and the folks at the embassy. I motorcycled across Java, went to Bali, really enjoyed that. And I, I realized the world is a really, really big place. Uh, this is obviously, a, you know, uh, quite obvious. Uh, and New York, as big as it was, was just a part of a, a larger global stage. So I really wanted to experience um, other parts of the world. And that's why when I had the opportunity to go to Cairo, I, I sold uh, some of my toys and decided to go over there. Some of my classmates were going to Paris and Madrid and Rome and other places. And I went to Cairo. I had really no familiarity with the Middle East at the time. Um, but when I was over there, I, I took Arabic. Um, I played on the university basketball team. Uh, I lived with a uh, Egyptian student for a part of the time I was there and just really enjoyed the interaction with people from other uh, areas. There were a lot of folks at AUC that year uh, that had been going to AUB in Beirut, American University in Beirut. In fact, I was initially going to go to Beirut, but 75, 76 was the height of the Civil War and AUB was closed down that year. And so a lot of Palestinian students and others that were going to AUB went to, to Cairo. And I got to uh, befriend a lot of individuals um, from the Gulf, from Jordan, Palestine, Egypt, and others. And so I, I really enjoyed my, my interaction uh, with them. And so when I came back here, I had already invested some time in the Middle East. I had some Arabic, and that's when I went to Texas and took additional Arabic and I then joined the agency in 1980. Which brings us to the present day. Quickly, yes. <laughs> 1980 to the present day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what everybody's here to, I think, hear about, which is how you're thinking these days um, about the world at large, this world at large that, that, you, that, that you said is a large world. To me, it feels like a small world, you know, where everything's just interconnected in a, in a, very, in a way that you just keep running into the same folks. Um, and I, I wanted you to address the fact that in New York, and I think in a lot of this country, for so many years, we were fixated on the problem of non-state actors and on the issue of having a government that was reinventing itself to think about how to deal with non-state actors. And now we have both non-state actors and state actors. And I guess my question is, are there challenges ahead internally? Forget about what else is out there in the world. To Do we have to reconfigure things again? or? Are things in place for dealing with both these uh, levels or different kinds of threats? Well, I think any type of stasis is a recipe for failure. Be and whether it's in a, a law school in, in terms of teaching, or whether it is in government, or whether it's in businesses and organizations, because the world is constantly evolving in so many different ways. And the um, environment within which we operate continues to change and adapt. And 
if we don't adapt and change with the times, we're really left behind. That's why when I was at CIA, I undertook a major reorganization to overhaul uh, the agency so that it would no longer be um, <clears throat> Um, organized in stovepipe fashion, that we would have much more interaction between the, the analysts and uh, the digital experts and the scientists and the operators and others. And I, I do believe that this country um, needs to continue to adapt and evolve over time. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that the openness of uh, the United States and Western democracies really allows uh, those who want to do us harm or do things to advantage them and disadvantage us, have tremendous opportunity to take full advantage of our laws and our system and environment here. And so whether or not you're talking about Russian interference in elections or various efforts to uh, steal intellectual property rights or exploit the digital environment for disruption, disabling of uh, the, the cyber realm, uh, and whether you're talking about intelligence services or whether you're talking about ISIS or organized crime or human traffickers or, or drug runners or others, there is just so much opportunity to do things that are illicit, illegal, immoral, and, and dangerous. And so therefore, I think our government and governments, I'm talking federal, state, local, and others, need to be in a, in a mindset of, of constant adaptation, which requires... Um, a constant um, effort to understand what's changing and how it's changing. And one of the things that I think is a challenge, and it was mentioned again in this class we just had, is how our government officials, as well as business leaders, are going to engineer the system so it maximizes the capabilities that exist within it. And that's why I'm a strong advocate of systems engineering. Again, I'm a liberal arts major, but I am a wannabe architect and engineer. I want to understand how things fit together, both in terms of physically, you know, processes, but also relationships between things. And I think our, our government in the 21st century right now in 2017 really needs to be thinking about how we're going to evolve a lot of our departmental practices, policies, and capabilities to um, operate within the 21st century highly technical environment when a lot of the, the structures, the practices, processes, as well as legal foundations were developed in the 20th century with 21st, 20th century technologies and systems in mind. And I just see the, the trend of, of uh, this evolutionary process accelerating in terms of every day there's a new app or there's a new uh, technological wonder that is, is changing, not just our ability to interact with one another, communicate, but even how the political environment is being shaped. You know, a decade ago, who thought that 140 characters meant anything? Or 280 characters? Now it, it is. And things are happening so quickly, it's very difficult for those who have responsibility for managing, handling, optimizing that, to, to keep up. And, and that's why I was I was very strong advocate at CIA to make sure people from different parts of our organization with, with particular expertise served rotations in other parts of the organization, but also other parts of the government, so they had a better sense of how they fit together in that broader ecosystem. That's where I think the systems engineering, systems design is, is so important. And so when I think about the challenges that we're facing on the digital front, on the terrorist front, non-state actors, state actors, mentioned earlier about the increasing collaboration that we're seeing between state actors, whether it be the Russia's, China's, North Korea's, and those cyber uh, um, entities um, that they're collaborating now in a way to obfuscate the state actors' role and involvement but also take advantage of tremendous sophistication, sophisticated capabilities among non-state actors. So again, we're continuing to uh, evolve as a, as a society, as a world. And that's where, again, where I talk about people who aspire and rise to positions of, of great authority in terms of governance really need to have as strong an appreciation as possible about these issues and their interrelationship. Um, 
And if you deal only transactionally with one issue, when indeed what you do has much broader effect, um, you can do great damage. All of a sudden, you know, you, you think you're doing something that's going to turn that light out over there, and so you, you pull a wire, and all of a sudden, the lights on this side of the room go out. Well, that's, you need to understand the relationship and the second and third order effects. Uh, and so that's why I think what I'd like to be able to do for you know, the next decade or two, I, I want to be able to better understand a lot of these interrelationships and how the government needs to operate in this fast-paced 21st century environment. Uh, one of the, the many recommendations I made when I was in government that was ignored <laughs> was that I thought that there needed to be a stand-up of an independent commission on cyber, um, something akin to the Manhattan Project, uh, that would allow the technologists, engineers, officials, futurists, you name it, to be able to get together and think about what do we need to do as a country, um, as also as a, as a globe, to be able to ensure that that digital environment is going to be an environment mostly for good and try to protect it against its um, misuse. Because I do believe that the public sector and the private sector really need to have a unprecedented um, relationship and collaboration, given that the internet is 85% owned and operated by the private sector. How is the government going to be able to operate in, in there? So there's just so much when I look in the future and how rapidly changing the world is that uh, simple portrayals of the challenges and simple and simple-minded solutions really, I think, do a great injustice, if not uh, pose great risks for our future. Do you think there's any country that's doing this, this better? And by this, I mean, um, you know, there are smaller countries, so it's easier for some countries. But um, is it, there's any country that seems to have evolved its governance better than we have in terms of the quick pace and the new challenges of the century? One of the ones that I've been most impressed with in terms of their um, evolution over the last several decades, and there are flaws, and I'll talk about the flaws in a moment, but Singapore is really a fascinating place. Part of it is because of the vision of Lee Kuan Yew, that he recognized that if Singapore was going to thrive in the future as a, as a nation's city-state, certain things need to happen. And I think he had a good sense of what, where Singapore fit in the larger ecosystem and the things that he wanted to make sure were going to be um, supported. Um, and the, the leadership of, of the Singapore government, from the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, and Defense Minister, Foreign Ministers, I met and interacted with them all, very impressive group of folks. Now, there are certain things that the Singaporean government has done as far as uh, suppressing some freedoms of speech, uh, particularly, uh, uh, and I raised with them the concerns that we, the U.S. government, had about what they were doing on the LGBT front. Uh, and it just shows that even a country as, as small, as limited, as capable as that still has a lot of those social, cultural, religious tensions that it needs to manage. And, but I, I, I am very impressed with them. Part of the challenge of the U.S. government, not only is that we're so big and unwieldy in many respects, we also have global responsibilities that no other country has in the, in the world. And so not only do we need to manage the changes within our own country and society, but also we're trying to continue to interact with different parts of the world. And I must say over the last eight months as I've interacted with a lot of people and uh, a lot of foreigners, um, there is great concern among a lot of our traditional allies and partners that the mantra now of, you know, America first, America first, means America first, second, and third, and that we're going to be flexing our muscles in a, in a manner that always advantages us. And given that we are the big 3,000-pound gorilla, that uh, we're not going to take into account the needs and aspirations of others that the United States always was uh, thought to be um, uh, a proponent of. And so there, the relationship, particularly among the Europeans, the transatlantic alliance that has been really the foundation for U.S. and, in fact, global security issues for many years, they feel as though this has been shaken because of a number of things that have been coming out from this administration, you know, questioning NATO and other things, and really wondering whether or not the United States is going to pursue economic trade political uh, objectives uh, that are in the interests of the current administration 
but not maybe in a more a, a global uh, manner. I think one of the things that um, people, one of the countries people associate your knowledge about um, is Saudi Arabia, which you have a deep history of, of knowledge about. And um, there's a lot of different stories you read about Saudis in the press these days, where they're headed. Um, you know, women maybe have the uh, right to drive now. Um, how much are they worried about terrorism you know, from Yemen creeping into Saudi Arabia? How long can they keep this at bay? What their relationship, their, 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 what's going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia and how things are playing out? How would you tell us to understand um, Saudi right now? <clears throat> well, Saudi Arabia, like Iran and other countries, they're not monoliths. And within their societies, uh, there is such a wide range of, of actors and attitudes, and especially so, I think, because uh, talk about societies and countries that have emerged from tradition uh, and almost you know, antiquated societies um, in the course of just a couple of generations. So you have the most conservative, the most um, um, almost isolated views and communities to those that have tremendous uh, international and cosmopolitan experience and everything in between. And that's what the Saudi government has been wrestling more and more with right now is how do you balance modernity and tradition and um, have these social changes such as women given the right to drive when you still have a very strong religious establishment that is part of the, um, the undergirding of the also monarchy and do it in a manner that's not going to be socially disruptive and potentially also dangerous because you're going to have the reaction from those very extremist and conservative elements. Uh, right now you have Mohammed bin Salman, who is the, the son of King Salman, who is basically the de facto leader. King Salman always had a good reputation within the family uh, of, of prudence, of, of piety, and of integrity. Uh, but he is in the waning days of his life and um, I think he's not necessarily in his, you know, dotage, but he is, you know, he has stepped back and he has relegated and delegated to his son a lot of the, the responsibilities for day-to-day -day government. And Mohammed Salman is a person of tremendous ambition, tremendous ambition, uh, tremendous vision, but also I think he um, has um, outsized um, expectations of what Saudi Arabia can accomplish in the region, globally, as well as almost internally. He's a person who's impatient, but who is moving with you know, great vigor. Um, he's alienated some elements of Saudi society, as well as the Saudi family, uh, because he is almost a one-man show. One of the, uh, the attributes of the Saudi royal family over the last 70, 80 years, and the reason why it was able to stay in power is because the, the sons of the king's founder, uh, Abdul Aziz, really shared um, responsibility and authority and power within the government. There were a lot of those sons that were head of the different ministries and also very strong and, and wealthy businessmen. But over time, more and more of those sons died away or they're now really in the, the waning days of their lives. And so there has been much more of a consolidation of power in the throne because you don't have the senior princes who can you know, compete with Mohammed Salman, and Mohammed Salman has taken advantage of that. I think he is somebody who has a strong interest in having Saudi society evolve and modernize. He has um, very strong views. I, I, I believe he is pretty anti-Iranian. I think he also has a, a, an anti-Shia dimension to him. Um, he was the one who directed this uh, war in Yemen. Um, and uh, with very uncertain um, outcomes um, that yet to be seen, but great consequences in terms of human lives. Uh, he is also a, uh, an understudy in many respects to Mohammed bin Zayed uh, from the UAE, who's the de facto leader of the UAE, who also has very strong feelings vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, political uh, uh, modernity in the Middle East. Uh, uh, they are very much opposed to sort of the Arab Spring movement because they see that that threatens authoritarian monarchies. Uh, so uh, Saudi Arabia has not yet gone through its internal revolution, 
will it go through a bloody revolution or will it be able to evolve to more of a constitutional monarchy and a more representative government smoothly? I think a lot of that is to be determined. But there are some real elements within Saudi society that are hotbeds of extremism. Um, you know, Wahhabism uh, has fueled a lot of the extremist and, and terrorist organizations worldwide. And that's why it's uh, somewhat ironic that the, the Saudis are pointing fingers at the Qataris for supporting, you know, these terrorist groups. Uh, you know, they both share blame in this area. Um, the Qataris have been more, I think, responsible for providing support to some of the organizations that are on the extremist end of the spectrum, like in Syria. The, the Saudis are more responsible for uh, providing resource and support to a lot of those um, <clears throat> organizations that have a religious component to that, but are being exploited and used by extremist and terrorist organizations. And also the Saudis have been responsible for putting out a lot of the, uh, the religious instructors and, and, and ulama in, in different parts of the world that, that really are quite conservative in their approach and tend to uh, be aligned with ex extremist uh, elements. So right now, like the Philippines and Indonesia? And yeah, it's one of the things that, um, talk about Southeast Asia, um, the Malaysians and the, the Singaporeans are concerned that a lot of these instructors that are being sent out from Saudi Arabia uh, fall on the extremist side of the spectrum, uh, which is causing a problem for them because they cannot say, well, you're not going to support the, you know, the ability of these religious institutions to teach you know, the young Singaporeans or others, but yet it's the, it's the type of instruction that is going on that um, tends to concern them. Interesting. One of the countries in Europe um, said that there could be no more Saudi imams, but they would instead pay. The Saudis had to take their money back and they would pay. They would replace the money. One of the governments, it's like France or something like that, recently. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'll turn it over to you guys. And of course, the question is Russia. Play this out for us. Where is it headed? I mean, sir, if you had to, you know, some, I said to somebody, um, uh, a Russian expert the other day, um, so are we in a new Cold War? And, and the person said to me, not flippantly, it's a hot war. Um, where is this going to end? No, it's, it's not a, a hot war, but there are uh, certainly tensions in the relationship. I, I am a proponent of trying to have an improvement in the relationship between Moscow and Washington. I think it's critically important. Uh, tried to do it during the Obama administration, the reset, but there were a number of things that happened, or the Russian illegals case, as well as you know, the invasion and annexation of, of Crimea and Ukraine and, and other types of things. So uh, I do believe that there are a lot of obstacles to the improvement in the relationship. Um, and when I look at Mr. Putin, I think Mr. Putin recognizes that um, he needs to be able to take advantage of opportunities that exist on the world stage today. Because if you look at the Russian prospectus, from a, a demographic standpoint, from an economic standpoint, um, brain drain, loss of entrepreneurial talent, you know, lack of diversity in the economy. They need to do some things to, uh, and to overhaul their system, but he's loath to do that because that would then put him and his system at, at risk. And so I think he's going to continue to exploit and take advantage of the openness of you know, Western societies to be able to shape you know, politics and politicians. That's why for many years the Russians have been very active in the European political theater. Uh, gain, letting or, or getting media outlets to put forth their propaganda and uh, bankrolling some of the politicians and political parties that are you know, advocates of the Russian point of view. Um, I, I think Mr. Trump is, is not going to you know, seek an adversarial relationship with Moscow for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that I think he recognizes that Mr. Putin does not necessarily play by the rules in many respects, you know, like Mr. Trump in a, in a business context, you know, had a reputation of, you know, going to the edge if not beyond. But also I think he recognized that Mr. Putin would not um, hesitate to stoop to certain things to undermine the United States and Mr. Putin personally. So I don't think he wants to provoke that. That said, the Congress of the United States is going to make sure that the relationship between the United States and Russia remains adversarial at this point because there are a lot of things that the Congress is rightly concerned about. So that's going to be a, a governor on, I think, Mr. Trump's inclination to try to improve relations. But I said we need to try to improve them. When I was at the agency, 
I had a lot of interactions with my Russian counterparts trying to work together in Syria, which was a very, very frustrating experience. We shared intelligence information with the Russians that saved many, many Russian lives because we were able to give them information of, you know, nature of terrorist threats uh, to them. But the, the Russians um, and Mr. Putin really believe that they need to recover uh, what they believe was unfairly lost ground on the global stage. Mr. Putin was a KGB agent, uh, officer when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed and the wall came down, and he said, and uh, reading the biographies, it was the, it was the moment of the greatest indignity of his life. Um, and I think he also has a valid point, and a lot of people have a valid point, that during the transition from the Soviet Union to Russia and the other states in the 1990s, the United States and the West did not do as much as we could have to facilitate the inclusion of, of Russia and those countries into the, the global economy and the world stage and give them a little bit more of an opportunity to thrive. I think there was still a fair amount of um, concern that uh, the former Soviet Union and Russia would seek to take advantage of that for their own good. Maybe that was the case. But when Putin and the Russians saw the continued emphasis on NATO expansion, continued what they saw as efforts to sideline Russia, they felt that we were not giving Russia its due. And I think Mr. Putin's prism is shaped by that. And also I think he does see things in a zero-sum fashion. And so whatever tarnishes the reputation of the United States or hurts us, it will, by definition, redound to Russia's benefit. So I think we're going to see a period of time in the coming years that this is going to continue to <clears throat> just um, you know, struggle along in terms of the relationship. There are areas where I think we can work together. <clears throat> the one area that we did work together with them was on the JCPOA, the Iranian nuclear agreement. And now the signals are that you know, yeah. we're now we're no longer going to abide by that. Uh, Paris Climate Accord, other types of things. Um, the signals that are being sent out of Washington is that there's not going to be the emphasis on multilateralism that there has been previously, and it's going to be much more bilateral, transactional. Um, and in some respects, Mr. Putin will find opportunities there because um, that's what he used to do and continues to do in, in Europe, mm -hmm. especially with former uh, businessmen who became politicians, like Berlusconi in Italy. Uh, and, and, and Helmut Kohl in Germany. There, there were, he, he likes that, that, that business transactional engagement, and um, I think that he's going to try to play that with uh, Mr. Trump.